Well, welcome to Church of Paravista on this Sunday, the 21st of June, 2020, in what could be the last occasion that we meet together as a congregation in this particular way. But I'm sure we're looking forward to the chance to get together face to face and do worship the way we're used to. Uh, this morning, um, Nathan will be continuing the theme on walking worthy of your calling and the focus will be uh, walk in knowledge with spiritual wisdom and understanding. And this was the desire of David as he wrote in Psalm 86. And let me introduce this service by referring to what David has to say. In verse 2, he makes this declaration, you are my God. In verse 8, among the gods there is none like you, O Lord. In verse 10, for you are great and do wondrous things, you alone are God. And against the background of that understanding of God, this is what David prays. Teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I will praise you, O Lord my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify your name forevermore, for great is your mercy towards me. So as we come to worship, let's remember the attributes of God that inspire us to walk worthy of him and the calling that he's given us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to once again unite our hearts in worship, spread in different locations, but united with one common desire, and that is to give you all the glory and all the praise this morning. And Father, as your word is presented to us, may we have hearts and minds that are open to receive your instruction so that we as your people at Church of Paravista can truly be people who walk worthy of the Lord. So Father, we commit this service to you and pray for your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to commence our service with uh, a song from the Church of Paravista music team called How Deep the Father's Love for Us. And after that, we'll hear the uh, Sam's next instalment with the Sam's video. Yeah. 
Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to News at Para Vista, the only place that delivers the news of Para Vista. This morning, there is nothing too noteworthy, but we will be doing our regularly programmed memory verse and song. So let's get right into the memory verse now. Wow, that sounded terrific. And now we're going to move on to our song, which is I Can Count On God.
what are you even doing? You're just a useless piece of trash filled with junk and there's nothing good. All I see is a big piece of rubbish. What are you doing? Um, I'm just dealing with our bin. Why? Um, haven't you been listening to the show? Yeah, I have, but that doesn't explain anything. Well, you know, Nathan's been talking about how we need to deal with our bin. Oh, okay. Yeah, I have been listening, but he's been talking about how we need to deal with our sins and walk as children in light. Are you sure he said that? I, I didn't hear light. I heard children of light. So I've been... I don't know if you know, but I've been working on this helicopter for weeks. And all this scrap metal isn't going to take itself back to the junkyard. So. Yeah, look, Mark, nothing about light or flight. I think you're the one who has not been listening because um, he's been talking about Ephesians 5, which says, follow God's example in everything you do because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love for others, following the example of Christ, who loved you and gave himself in his sacrifice to take away your sins. So, no bins or fly in there. Huh, well... Yeah, I, that does make a lot more sense, actually. Yeah, probably. So... Hmm, should we just walk away and pretend nothing happened? I think that's for the best, yeah. I think this bin better keep its mouth shut. Mm. One of the opportunities we have, uh, even though we are separated physically, is to unite our hearts and minds in prayer. And we do have a number of aspects uh, that warrant prayer uh, in our community as a church. Um, Dorothy Duckworth has recently had uh, hip surgery. Jane Petrie goes into hospital next week for some surgery on her, her hand. Uh, Danny uh, had a rather traumatic uh, encounter with an accident his uh, neighbour had, and so we need to pray for Danny and also for Danny and Susie as they take time away this week. For Nathan's dad, as uh, he continues in this uh, extreme uh, state uh, and separated uh, there in New Zealand from Nathan and the family. And also remember Lily George as she uh, is awaiting the uh, test results so that there can be surgery to assist her. Andrew Blackwell, of course, is in hospital, but soon to be released, but again, continue to pray for him. And also Nanette and Brendan Spry, as they too struggle with uh, Nanette's health. So let's bring these matters before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a prayer hearing God and that you hear uh, all of our prayers as we bring them to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Father, we do bring these pastoral needs before you. We know that you are aware of them, uh, but we bring them before you as uh, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ to support those who have needs. Father, we pray for Dorothy Duckworth that she would have a speedy recovery and, and good health as she recovers from her hip surgery. For Jane Petrie, we ask for peace of mind and uh, your provision for her as she has surgery this week. And Father, we do uphold Danny before you as he had to witness a fairly traumatic accident with his neighbour. We pray that you would uh, give him peace and uh, particularly this week as uh, Susie and Danny take time away, may they do so uh, and be greatly refreshed. Father, we continue to uphold Nathan as our senior pastor with uh, the concerns over his father uh, in this uh, terminal illness that he has. We just pray for your peace to be upon Nathan and Julie and the family. And too, Lord, for Lily George, we thank you that uh, um, there is a possibility for some hopeful outcome from, good, from this surgery that's anticipated. We pray that that can proceed uh, without uh, much delay. And Lord, too, we think of our brother Andrew and also Nanette, uh, too, who have uh, suffered debilitating illnesses. We do pray that you would have your healing touch upon them and restore them to good health. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 
This morning as we uh, remember the Lord around the communion table and remind ourselves afresh of what communion is all about, our brother Steve White is going to lead us with a, an introduction. So thank you, Steve. About a month ago, Rob Morosi brought us to the communion table and one of the first things he said was, do we ever remember any communion services? I'm glad Rob asked that. Um, I remember as an 18 year old going into the Air Force as a cadet and it was pretty tough that first year. We were the first of first year out of four um, and there's no doubt that by the end of the week the profanity, uh, even the blasphemy really got to me as a young Christian and I was really down spiritually. It was my great joy then to get to the base chapel every Sunday to refresh my soul. Um, as was the habit, the, uh, the Air Force and indeed all the services use the Book of Common Prayer as the basis of their services and the words that come out of the Book of Common Prayer leading into communion have always been a great joy to me as I read them. Uh, just a bit of history there. The, uh, up till about 500 years ago, if you went to church, you would hear, in an English setting anyway, you would hear the communion service in Latin. And unless you understood Latin, it didn't mean much. And it was at the time of the Reformation, uh, King Henry VIII commissioned Thomas Cranmer, the, uh, then the Archbishop of Canterbury, to produce a service in English. And for the last 480 years, we've been able to have that privilege that wasn't there before. Um, Thomas Cranmer then continued on as the Archbishop of Canterbury through Edward VII, but was burned at the stake by Queen Mary for having done what he did. Uh, in this time, this month, I think we're remembering the persecuted church, and uh, yes, there are those forebears uh, who certainly paid a price for their faith. I'm just going to read just a few excerpts from it because to me, and for the nine years after I joined the Air Force while I was still single, I would try and make it my habit to go to the base chapel, even though later in the morning I'd go to another service outside the base. So this is just a few excerpts from the leading. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts be open, all desires known and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. God spoke these words and said, I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt have no other gods but me. Thou shalt not make to thyself any graven image, nor the likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or in the earth beneath, or in the waters under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down to them, nor worship them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, and visit the sins of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, but show mercy unto thousands in, of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain. Remember that thou keep, the holy, uh, keep holy the Sabbath day, Six days thou shalt labour and do all that thou hast to do, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any manner of work. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. Honour thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not commit... Thou shalt, not, do not, thou shalt not do murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbour. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbour's house, nor his neighbour's wife, nor his servant, nor his maid, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is his. Lord, have mercy on us, and write all these laws in our hearts, we beseech thee. 
Almighty and ever-living God, who by thy holy apostle has taught us to make prayers and supplications to give thanks for all men, we humbly beseech thee most mercifully to receive, um, to inspire, continue the universal church with a spirit of truth, unity and concord. And grant that the, all they that do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. Ye that do truly and earnestly repent you of your sins are in love and charity with your neighbours and intend to lead a new life following the commands of God and walking from henceforth in his holy ways, draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament to your comfort and make your humble confession to Almighty God. And now I'm going to read the prayer that leads in the taking of the elements. Uh, and after that, I'll ask those of you at home to take what uh, you have prepared for yourself. This is the prayer. We do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy great, many and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table. But thou art the same Lord, whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to take the flesh of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Thanks uh, very much, Steve, for um, uh, sharing with us from that uh, common book of prayer. I know over many, many years uh, that approach to communion and to worship has been uh, greatly beneficial to so many. So thanks for, for the take on that. Now, for the past seven weeks, uh, we've been thinking about the concept of our ongoing Christian walk. And, you know, this is known as uh, the believer's progressive sanctification. Now, progressive because our walk, as is our life, is, is a marathon. It's not a sprint. Uh, the Christian life is a, it has a beginning and has an end, but it is a, over a period of time. That's why we say progressive sanctification, because each of us uh, who are followers of, of the Lord Jesus, we are progressively being conformed into the image of Christ through and uh, by God's grace. You see, that's what sanctification means. It's a, a sanctifying thing. Our lives were, were once entrapped in sin, but now we're new creations uh, we, there is a change in our heart, there's a change in our behaviours. And I reckon that the verses in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to 14, explain this better for me than any other passage of Scripture. And in Titus 2, it, it says this, Titus 2, verse 11, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us, to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, who are zealous for good works. If you want a definition of progressive sanctification, this is it. But as you're all aware, we've been spending some time in the, in the book of Ephesians to really unpack what this means. You know, we've, we've looked at what it means to, to walk in a manner that's worthy of our calling. We've, we've discussed 
how we used to walk and the demands of the new walk. You know, for us who, who claim to be followers of Christ, for us who can claim to be ambassadors for the King, there should be a difference in our lives. Our lives should be countercultural. It should be evident in everything we do, in our, in our speech, in our actions, in our unity, in our thirst after holiness, in our love for one another, in our reflection of God's glory as light to the world. And it should also reflect in the way we walk, walking in wisdom, redeeming the time that God has so graciously given us. You see, as we've walked through the, the, the book of Ephesians, right at the start, as followers of Christ, you are, you are saints and you are chosen, you're, you're predestined and, and adopted as sons of the King. And our lives are part of God's masterpiece. Can you imagine that? Your, your life is like a, a picture painted by the master's hand. We are his workmanship. That's what Ephesians 2.10 tells us. We are his workmanship, his masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's who we are in Christ. Jonathan Edwards, he, he described the sanctification process in this way. I found this really helpful as I came across this. I was reading through a book by John Piper called The Peculiar Glory, and in here was this quote from Jonathan Edwards. In relation to sanctification, we are not merely passive in it, nor yet does God do some and we do the rest. But God does all and we do all. God produces all and... We act all, for that is what he produces, our own acts. God is the only proper author and fountain. We are the only proper actors. We are in different respects, wholly passive and wholly active. Now that may sound like a, a fairly heavy statement with these words of active and passive, but what Edwards is getting to is, when we're called into a relationship with Christ, we are his workmanship. We are required to put all of our lives on the lordship of Christ, to put some skin in the game and, and walk worthy. And God knows the walk he has prepared for us. And God will empower that walk through empowering of his spirit. Well, this week we're going to look at a, another aspect of this topic and how we should walk in a manner worthy of our calling. But we're going to do this from the book of Colossians this morning. And uh, I think it, in Colossians chapter 1, we will read shortly, we, we see that uh, our knowledge of Christ will stir our affections towards him. Our knowledge will stir our affections and our affections is what motivates us to live a life worthy and pleasing to the Lord. You see, the book of Colossians is kind of an interesting little letter and uh, you can turn there now before we read it. And You see, Paul is writing to a church that he only knows by word of mouth. It's not a church that he founded on one of his missionary journeys, uh, but it's, you know, it's a place he's never visited. But however, he receives a, a testimony from a fellow worker. Epaphras is the, the gentleman who, who comes and visits Paul in prison and, and passes on what's going on in this church. Epaphras was likely saved in Ephesus. And he goes and church plants, his, church plants up in Colossae, which is about 190 kilometers sort of due east of Ephesus, up the valley. By the time that Paul wrote to this particular uh, city, it was relatively insignificant. Some, you know, 300 years earlier, it was actually a major metropolis in, in, the, in the Asian world. 
But, you know, like most governments, when they take over an empire, they, they build new roads. And the Romans built a road that bypassed Colossae. And uh, so Colossae in itself, uh, in this time, was missing out on some of the economic prosperity of other, system, other cities. The, the road no longer passed through their, their city. Laodicea was the, their closest neighbour, about 15 kilometres to the northwest. And as I said, Ephesus was the major city that was close to them, about 190 kilometres, 100 miles sort of uh, east of them. The population of this city was, it was multicultural, multi-ethnic. And it was known for a fine product, a fine woolen product, uh, which was very dark red, and it was called Colossian wool. But you know, with a, such a diverse culture and exposure to those travelling from west to east, Colossi provided a melting pot for philosophical ideas and, and world, different world views. And as you read through this letter, if you take time this week to read through this short letter, it's only four chapters, I know you've been reading through Ephesians, but stop and read through Colossians just to get a, a feel for what's going on in this letter. You, you won't find a particular point of heresy or, or the like that Paul is addressing. But there seems to be a couple of things that are concerning him and Epaphras about this new church. There seems to be a deep concern that there's no relapse into pagan ways of thinking and acting. You sort of get that in chapter 3, verses 5 through 11. And likewise, there seems to be a concern by Paul and Epaphras that uh, there's to be no acceptance of unorthodox teaching. And you see a heavy emphasis on the deity of Christ through this book. And perhaps that's a response to the potential dangers that could flow into this church. So really Paul's, I guess, emphasis on writing this letter is to provide a, a corrective, a biblical corrective to potential future errors. There's no error on the, on the map, but he's thinking, hey, this is the way the church could go if it's not careful. And he wants to provide a corrective against false doctrine, especially doctrine around who Christ is and what he has done. Because you know, whenever false doctrine creeps in, compromise occurs. And I think that's at the heart of this, this letter. Because when false doctrine and unorthodox behavior creep in, your life becomes incredibly unfruitful. You're blowing into the wind. And your walk becomes unworthy. But you know, they are the general principles of the letter. Now let's just look at the opening statements because I think these provide a wonderful encouragement to us today. Let's read together in Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 uh, to 14. This is obviously Paul speaking and, and Epaphras. We always thank God, the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and growing, as it also does among you since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God and truth. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. 
He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. What a wonderful opening to a letter. Paul starts with a general thanksgiving for these folks. Verses 3 to 8, you can, you can see the heart of this, this apostle who's in chains and, and has never met them, but you just see his, his heart and love for these people. And how do we know that? Because of these two things. He always thanks God for them, and he is praying for them. Verse 3. And he develops this further. He says, I've heard of your faith. You have evidence of the faith that you have in Christ. And I give thanks and I pray because of your Christ-centered love that you have for all believers. And I pray and give thanks because of the gospel hope that you have. Isn't that a wonderful way of starting a letter? I've heard of your faith in Christ. I've heard of your faith in Christ. I've heard of the love that you have for all the saints because of that faith. And I hear of the hope that you have. The hope for your future inheritance that is laid up for you in heaven. You know, in other New Testament letters, it's a good study to do. See how often Paul uses this type of introduction. See how often he uses, I guess, the, the, the things he, he really goes strongly at with the Corinthian church when he talks about uh, faith, hope, and love, that these three, three things remain. He seems to be using those three gifts to describe the activity of this church. You see, this church is a, a growing church, and it's, it's centered around these truths, the truth of the gospel. And Paul likens the impact of this truth to a, a well-watered, a well-fertilized fruit tree. You know, just bursting forth with fruit. I think here you see bursting forth with, with fruit of the Spirit. You see, the fruit of the gospel is ongoing in this church. It's ongoing and it, it's been displayed in their deep faith for Christ, in their deep love for one another, and in their deep hope that an inheritance is coming. And you see... This is part of progressive sanctification. This is part of our walk as followers of Christ. When the fruit of the gospel is in our life, and remember it's not a one-time event, the gospel impacts everything we do, then this is the, the response. Strong in faith, strong in love, strong in relation to the hope that we have. See, when the gospel is applied to our everyday lives, there is a fruitfulness that is clearly evident. Clearly evident by the unity we have in our community towards one another. Remember that in Ephesians, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. The same thing here. These folks are, are unified because of the truth of the gospel. Not just within their community, I would suggest that this fruitfulness is seen beyond their community, in their neighborhoods, in their places of work. They are identified as different. They are strong in the truth of the gospel. Now, 
are unified by the Spirit. Their love is seen in the Spirit. Notice that really beautiful term at, in verse 8. After Paul commands the work of Epaphras and uh, the, the, the absolute impact he's had on this church in spreading the gospel, he says, the faithful minister of Christ has told, told me that you maintain your love in the Spirit. You are unified for the sake of Christ. So when you read those first five verses, how do, how do you relate to a church like that? Pretty solid, right? A solid church. Their love hasn't been quenched for Christ. Their faith hasn't been quenched. Their hope is solid. And you put the mirror up against words like this and, and you've got to ask the question yourself. And how would we write our church? How would we write church at Paravista under these three things? Under our faith in Christ, our love for one another and for our community, and our hope of eternal home a place of security, a place promised by Christ. You know, this is a question for, I guess, the leadership of our church. How do we see our church in these things? You see, it's not about faithfulness. It's about faith in the person of Christ. He is our guiding light, and, and he is the one who shapes and equips and provides us with the perseverance to, to press into him and to, to love his people and to share the gospel and to be secure in the hope of the promises of God. As individuals, how, how do you rate this in your life? How strong is your faith? Are you tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine? Are you into multiple conspiracy theories about what's happening? Or are you placing your faith in the one who holds all things in the power of his hand? Is your love expressed to your friends, to your neighbors, to your family in a Christ-centered way, which is sacrificial? Does your walk and your, does your life represent the hope that you have? The hope that one day you'll be with Christ. One day you'll be in his glorious presence. Why? Because he has promised it. And he has died for you. And that's a wonderful hope, right? So I ask you to ask those questions of your own life. How would Paul, if you like, address me? Would he address me in strong terms like he has these Colossian believers? But then I guess the next question is, so if this, this church is so on song or so on point, what do you say to a church that's modeling these vibrant uh, ways of fruitful Christianity? What do you say to a church like that? And I think we, we have the answer in verses 9 to 14. You see, Paul goes back and he says, for this reason, so I'm reading from the NIV here, because I think the NIV does a really good job of verse 9. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. Other translations may translate that last phrase, knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, referring to our spiritual wisdom and understanding. I think the tense of the NIV is correct here when you go back to the originals. 
It's the Spirit that empowers our wisdom and understanding because it's God who fills us with this knowledge of his will. You see, as Paul addresses this solid, fruitful church, he, he turns and he, he refocuses them. He reintroduces the fact that he is consistently from day to day praying for them. Please notice that he doesn't cease in his effort. Now a question for us, do we, do we pray daily for our witness as a church in the community in which we're in? Do we have the same heart of, of prayer It's a, it's a call in many ways to pray. But notice what he's praying for. He's not praying for a physical well-being or a, uh, some form of that type of prayer. He, he's starting right back at a, a basic spiritual issue. He's praying that this fruitful church will continue to be filled by God, with the knowledge of God's will. That's what he's praying. That's what he's interceding for. See, in here, the, the filling is a divine act of God. God can only provide inside of his will. God is the only one. He does that through his word. You know, Paul's not got some special direction or some particular thing in mind here for one's life. But he's wanting to impress upon them. I'm praying that you'll have a deep and abiding understanding of the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's his prayer. I want you to know Christ. I want you to know him more deeply than you've ever known him before. And that only comes from God. You see, God discloses knowledge of himself. And it was unthinkable that someone could simply learn to know God. Well, run that by you. It's unthinkable that someone could just simply learn to know God. You see, most truths can be learned, but divine truth must be revealed. Divine truth must be revealed by God himself. Well, the question there for us as believers, how, how do we place ourselves in an environment to know God? To know him more deeply, to understand the revelation of Christ. Or well, in our context, we have life groups, small groups. We have our church community. We have some parachurch organizations that help us to know God more deeply and intimately. It's things like Bible study fellowship and, and some parachurch organizations like that. But individually, I think it comes down to one central thing. Because God reveals himself through his word, commitment to God's word is central in knowing about him. You see, too often I think I, I see believers who just put this to the side. They don't invest daily time in God's word. And when that happens, they don't see God's word as their authority over their lives. I appeal to you, don't be like that. But be filled with the knowledge of of his will through the Spirit. And see, this knowledge produces wisdom and understanding, according to this verse. It helps you with discernment. It helps you understand. You know, Aristotle once said there were, there were three virtues in life, wisdom, understanding, and prudence. Throughout the Old Testament, we have wisdom and understanding paired together many, many times. I think when they're paired together, especially when you look through some of the wisdom literature, I mean the Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and the Psalms and, and Job, you, you'll see 
that a combination of wisdom and understanding suggests the ability to discern the truth and to make good decisions based on truth. You think of Solomon as one person who did that in 1 Chronicles early in his kingly ship. He, he asked for wisdom and understanding and God granted it. It didn't work out too well for him in the end because he chased after other things and his heart slowly became cold towards the things of God. But it doesn't avoid the principle that wisdom and understanding are together and they're important. You see, Paul is praying that Firstly, uh, that their intellectual understanding will actually result in a transforming behavior. See, what you know must determine, must end up in actions. And that's where he's, he's going with this. See, the knowing of what God has done, the faith, the hope, and the love that we have because of, of Christ is knowing what God has done. And he's saying, be filled with these things and it will determine your walk. That's what he starts with in verse 10. So to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. And this walk will be characterized by several things. Characterized by several things. The walk will be characterized by bearing fruit in every good work. You see, when we follow Christ and we walk as he has designed us to walk, when we walk in the, in the majesty of living our lives to the full under his lordship, we'll bear fruit in every good work. We'll yield a harvest of righteousness, which results in serving others. Bearing fruit in good works means we are serving others out of a love for Christ. You know the other issue of bearing fruit? Is sometimes to be fruitful you need to be pruned. The dead wood needs to be cut off. The refiner's fire needs to come in and, and shape our attitudes and our heart towards him. So when we bear fruit, it is a result of God's work in our lives. Secondly, you'll increase in the knowledge of God. And this is God's doing, as I've said before. This is part of the filling process. It's our Christian life and our practice always results in what we know about God. And this increasing is an intensive thing. It's based on wanting to know more about Christ and his work and his truth. It's a bit like in the garden, actually, when you, when you see your, your plants failing, you grab a bit of sea soil and you, you spray it with sea soil and, and the fertilizer increases the growth. I think that's what Walking in a manner worthy of the Lord is being filled and being earnest and wanting to increase in this knowledge of God. Not for the sake of knowledge, but for the sake of doing. Thirdly, uh, to be strengthened with all power according to God's glorious might. This is a result of a worthy walk. You bear fruit, you increase and you, strength, you are strengthened. And this strength relates to endurance and patience. The reason we are strengthened is so we can endure things. And we are to be patient with thanksgiving and joy. You see, endurance is a, is a resolute endurance under a difficult circumstance. That's what it's referring to. This is the type of endurance you need. It needs to be resolute. I've had a, a dear friend this week, a, the wife of one of the pastors I served with back at Canterbury Gardens. She's had a, a battle of cancer for the last 10 months. Quite a, a quick deterioration. And in relation to endurance, I just want to read this testimony from my friend John. 
wife's name's Farina. Yes, Farina's body has deteriorated and it will continue to do so as we approach the number of days that were appointed for her by God a long, long time ago. But what, I can, what I can tell you is that her faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ has not deteriorated. Even as she approaches the end of this life and prepares to enter eternity, her faith in the Lord has never wavered. She prays for you consistently and with all of her being. I wish you could hear it. The witness she has been here in the hospital has been a delight for me and our children to observe. And now for all of us, the words from Scripture that is on our bathroom mirror, but more importantly in our hearts and minds. We wait and hope for the Lord. He is our hope and our shield, in whom our hearts rejoice. For we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. He indeed is the Lord. We love you. Dear friend of mine, enduring a major trial, but enduring it in the strength of the fullness of God. The other part of being strengthened is to have patience. And this relates to when you're condemned or discouraged in your faith. And finally, a walk that is worthy, one that has been filled with the knowledge of his will is one that is thankful. Thankful. As always seeing what you have received as a gift from God. And this thankfulness, at the basis of thankfulness, we see in verses 17, uh, 13 and 14. The basis of the thankfulness is that we are now qualified to receive an inheritance. What does that mean? God will and has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son. We've gone from darkness to light at God's initiative. God initiates the salvation and sanctification process and he rescues and delivers us. He uses the word of redemption and forgiveness to buy back a term, a price is paid, and we know that is from the cross, which appeases the justice of God. And then the free act of forgiveness is given as a gift. You see, the cross represents the interrelationship of these two aspects of God's nature, his forgiveness and his justice. What a tremendous thing to dwell on as we give thanks. So these marks will be marks for every believer. God fills us with an understanding and a knowledge of his will. We command to walk and live a life worthy of our walk and seeks to please the Lord. God does the growing. God does the strengthening. We bear the fruit. We give thanks. And God qualifies us to receive an inheritance to deliver us from darkness and redeem us and to forgive our sins. This is a secure promise. Because that God's initiative, and he does not change his mind. God's initiative in salvation and sanctification guarantees our inheritance as promised to us. These are tremendous words of encouragement and exhortation for us who choose to follow Christ. May this be a blessing to you this week as you walk in him. All right, now we, have, we now have the pleasure of uh, listening and singing a song. It's uh, an old song we know well called Crown Him, but with a new twist. So enjoy uh, this part and this musical rendition of this famous old hymn. Crown Him, Majesty. Thanks. Well, I hope you enjoyed that, uh, that particular song. I, I love it every time I listen to it. I turn the music up and, and uh, sort of uh, wake the neighbors up, if you like. But um, I trust that in this coming week that you will walk worthy. You'll be filled with the knowledge of God's will with all spiritual wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives us. You'll bear fruit. You'll increase in the knowledge of God. You'll be strengthened 
and you'll give thanks as you reflect upon what Christ has done for you. Hey, and the great news is, this is the last time that we'll have to do this. From next week on, we're going to be uh, meeting together. Initially, it's going to be two services with a, a maximum of 75 in this hall, but we have an overflow as well, which we can use. But we're going to be sending a lot more details out to you all on Monday and Tuesday just to let you know how next week is going to pan out. We still will live stream. We will live stream at 11 o'clock at our second service. Even though it will be a live service here, we will be streaming uh, to you all who can't make it. But we'd love to see you all. Uh, we're itching to get back together, to spend some time together, fellowshiping together, and just being the community God wants us to be. So um, let me pray for us. And then uh, we look forward to seeing you live next week. So let's pray together. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we, we do thank you that uh, you empower us to live a life that is worthy of the calling to which you have called. Father, we pray that our disobedience won't hinder us. Father, renew and unite in us a passion to follow you wholeheartedly. Father, help us to, to dive and dig deeply into your word as your revealed truth. Enable us to love our neighbours. Enable us to have a unity amongst ourselves as even the world to see. Father, help us to dwell frequently on the wonderful gift of salvation that you have given. You have redeemed us, brought us back, and you have given us forgiveness of our sin from your free hand of grace. Father, for those of us who don't know that freedom, we pray that your spirit will break hearts open and folks will respond to the power of the gospel. We thank you that we can meet again. We thank you that in the coming weeks that we'll be together. We thank you for protecting us during this last three months. And we just pray for your hand of blessing in the week ahead. In Christ's precious name we pray. Amen.